In property, there's loads of jargon. Do you know the difference between your BTL and an LTV and all the other jargon that's thrown out there? Well, we demystify it all in this video to help you understand exactly what those experts are going on about. So let's start, start with the basics, BTL. Now, if you're really new, you may think it's a sandwich, but BTL stands for buy to let. And it's what we do. We buy properties to let them out. It's that simple. Next up, a flip. So if you're not buying a property and letting it out, you're buying a property, doing it up in some kind of way and selling it on again. If you do that, that could be called buy to sell. So you see the acronym BTS rather than BTL, but also commonly known as flipping. Okay, next up on the list is HMO. You've probably heard of HMOs mentioned many a time. This stands for houses or homes of multiple occupancy. So it's taking a building, often a house, and putting multiple tenants into that one property. And that's it. So instead of having one tenant with one tenancy agreement, you'll have multiple tenants with multiple tenancy agreements. And that's a HMO. Another way of having a property occupied is instead of having one tenant or even multiple tenants for a long period of time, you have people coming for shorter periods of time, maybe just a couple of days, a week, a couple of weeks. If you do that, that could either be a holiday let or serviced accommodation. Serviced accommodation is a newer term. It's something that's only really been around for the last few years since the rise of Airbnb. Basically, it's exactly the same as a holiday let. It just tends to be something like a city centre flat rather than something on the coast. It just means that rather than having a long-term tenant, you just have people coming and going all the time, kind of like a hotel. Okay, rent to rent. People who participate in rent to rent look to get a property from somebody who owns it, often a house with multiple rooms, and pay that person a rent. And then they will go on to rent the rooms individually, which total a higher amount, which makes them a profit. And that's called rent to rent. Now, if you don't own the property, you just have a contract with the person who does own the property for some period of time. So it's not property investment, it's more of a property business, but people do it for cash flow, and that's rent to rent. I'm glad I've been left for the next one. Lease option. Basically, it's the same sort of thing. You will not own a property. You will just take that property over and you'll have the agreement to be able to run that property yourself and let it out. But there's another component. You'll have the option to buy that property at a fixed price in the future. So it's a lease. You have the right to take on the property and let it out. And there's also the option of buying it. But if you see that term on a forum or something in the future, at least you now know roughly what it means. Okay, so that's types of investment. Let's now get into stuff around valuations or finance. So first one, BMV, below market value. So what BMV is meant to be is that you look for a property and you get it at a discount that is below the market rate and therefore called below market value. Now, it's hard to establish what below market value is. You need to do a lot of work. Some people dispute it altogether. But ultimately, that's what it stands for, below market value. But a more simplistic way to look at it is a good discount or a good deal. So that's BMV. And the discount that you get will be the discount from open market value or OMV. So when a valuer goes out to see what a property is worth, they'll take a look at it and take a look at its condition, see what's sold recently, compare it to what else is on the market, and they will come up with their opinion of the open market value, OMV. What you would expect in the current market someone to be willing to pay for the property. We've got another V, it's GD. GDV. GDV is gross development value. So this is often used in development. So if you are looking at a block, you're building something out, what's it worth? What's the total sales price of that development? So what's the gross development value? And one more V for you before we move on, LTV. LTV is loan to value. So this is what you'll see around mortgages. And it kind of makes sense when you think about it. It is the loan that you get as a proportion of the value. So if you take out a loan of £50,000 and you've got a property that's worth a value of £100,000, then your loan to value would be 50%. Next up, OPM is other people's money. So it's a bit like loan to value, but sometimes you hear this one bounded about. And it's used in leverage or other people's money, which could be a bank or an individual to further your property investment endeavours. Right, let's move on from the three-letter acronyms and talk about valuation metrics instead. So the first one that you'll often see is gross yield, and that is very simply the annual rent that you'd expect a property to get divided by the amount that you pay for it. 
So a property produces an annual rent of £10,000. It's worth £100,000, or that's what you pay for it. Therefore, the gross yield, 10%. Easy. The other type of yield is net yield. A little bit more complicated to work out, but a little bit more useful because it takes more into account. So the net yield is the profit that you would expect to make from a property after you've deducted your expenses, divided by the price you pay for it. So that property that's producing £10,000 in rent annually will say that you've got costs of £5,000, such as your management fees and so on. Once you've deducted those, the actual amount of money in your pocket is £5,000. The property is worth £100,000, therefore the net yield is 5%. Okay, next up on the list is ROI, or sometimes referred to as ROCE. ROI is return on investment, and ROCE is return on capital employed. But basically, it's the same thing. And that's how much money are you putting into the deal versus how much you're going to get out in income each year. No, more jargon for you around valuations and finance. So back onto the finance side... Bridging is like a short-term mortgage, so it's money that you'll borrow against a property, just like a mortgage, but you're only borrowing it for a period of normally up to 12 months. So next up, SVR, Standard Variable Rate. So you'll see this when you go for a mortgage. Now you have your discounted rate in the beginning, or often have a discounted rate, but the Standard Variable Rate is what you will default onto if you do not change your mortgage. Now some people have done very well with Standard Variable Rates because before the crash, you had higher interest rates and the standard variable rate was a percentage above the base interest rates and then when the market crashed and interest rates were slashed people had very favorable standard variable rates clause 24 this is one that could easily make no sense to you also known as the tenant tax shouldn't be called that also known as lots of other things but basically it's all the same thing it's where the government as one of the first uh, actions that they took against landlords decided that you could no longer claim your interest as a cost so what does that mean well in a business if you borrow money in order to run your business and you pay interest on that money then that interest is normally a cost of doing business. In property, they've decided that that doesn't apply anymore. So you can't offset your interest as a cost of doing business. You can instead claim an allowance. It's all very complicated, but the end effect of that is that you're probably going to pay more in tax than you would have done before, even though you're making the same profit that you were in the first place. Okay, moving on now to tenancies and management. Okay, so first up is AST. Assured shorthold tenancy, basically just your standard tenancy agreement, often ranging from six months to two years. That's what most mortgage companies will accept, so that's what most people do. Can vary in length though, but an AST is just your tenancy agreement between you, the landlord, and your tenants. Something else that's quite simple but has lots of letters attached to it to make it sound more complicated is LHA, also known as DSS, also now known as UC or Universal Credit. They are all different ways of people receiving benefits because they're on low income. LHA is the more recent version, that's local housing allowance, and Universal Credit is now what they're not very successfully trying to roll out to replace that and replace lots of other benefits. Benefits all in one. So next up, leasehold and freehold. So freehold, the more simple one of the two. Freehold is if you buy a property, you own the land. So the land is yours. You own the property on that land. Really simple. It's called a freehold. Leasehold, slightly different. You don't own the land. Somebody else does. But they lease you a proportion of that land. So if it's an apartment, sometimes houses, but more common with apartments, they lease that part of the land to you. The length of which can vary. You can get leaseholds that are just about to run out and therefore there's an opportunity to do a good deal but you won't be able to get a mortgage on it. Or you can get leaseholds all the way to 999 years. New builds, well you tend to get 100 to 25 years. Some providers offer you less and maybe 99 years but I always look for 125 years or more as a general rule of thumb. So that's leasehold and freehold. So let's talk about ending a tenancy. And to end a tenancy, you'll use a particular legal mechanism. There's two main ones. There's section 21 and there's section 8. So if you see someone talking about section 21 or issuing a section 21 notice, what they're talking about is saying to a tenant, it's time for you to leave. The main difference between a section 21 and a section 8 is that with section 21, it's supposed to be the case that if you do everything properly, then the tenant cannot object. They can't take you to court. They have to move out when you want them to, and that is that. Section 8, by contrast, is not as good for you as the landlord because it's you saying, I want this tenant to move out, but if they can test it and they don't want to and they take it to court, the judge can find against you and allow them to stay. There's a lot of detail to know around those. If you find yourself wanting a tenant to leave, you should find out how to do that in a lot more detail. You should get some support, maybe get your letting agent to help you do it. 
But for our purposes right now, section 21 and section 8 are just two different ways of ending a tenancy. So there you go, a whole load of jargon, acronyms, strange terms particular to property. So hopefully that will have been a useful refresher for you on certain terms. And like I said before, probably one or two others where it's like, oh, that's what it means. Because it's so easy to just let things drift by and not think to ask the question. But if you've got something useful from this video, you'll get so much more from the Property Podcast, where every week we bring you what investors really need to know. You can listen anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Just search Property Podcast.